And the problem isn't with that. The problem is with what you and I in our generation think is forgiveness of sins. We don't see forgiveness as it really is. And like so many things in our world, we're losing touch with reality because we're losing a sense of what truths really are. And so all of us probably suffer from a total misconception of what forgiveness is. Let me give you an example that we'll all just know immediately and sympathize with. You have a roommate, or you have a husband, or a wife, or a friend, someone who lives with you. And one day, they just burst out in a show of bad temper and just criticize you and tear you apart. And so there's a coolness between you for the next couple of days. And then they come to you and they say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And you, of course, want the relationship to be right, so you forgive them. And it goes on like that for a week or two weeks. And then once more they burst out in a show of bad temper and they tear you apart and they criticize you. And there's coolness between you for the next two days. And then they come again and they say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And you say, yes, I will, because you want the relationship. A little harder for you this time because you forgave them last time. And it was right from your end, but it didn't seem to give them any ability to continue to be right with you. But you still say, I forgive you. Goes all right for another two weeks. And then there comes a day and they burst out again in bad temper. And they criticize you and tear you apart. And there's coolness between you for the next two days. And then they come to you and they say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Well, you'd, I mean, you don't know what to do. You just don't know what to do. You, you know that. We'd all be in the same boat. Sure, we want to forgive them. Of course we want to forgive them because we want things to be right between us as they used to be. But we begin to wonder in our minds, is this forgiveness? I mean, I'll forgive him, I'll forgive her, but what difference does it make if the relationship really is going to continue to go through these agonizing crises? And isn't there something inside your heart that says, look, I want to forgive them, but I want a relationship. I want a relationship of love. I want a relationship that is continuous. I want a relationship of peace. I want a good friend here whom I feel I can really trust. It seems to me there's something that needs to be done in their heart that will enable them to walk free from this bad temper. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how often I forgive them. Our relationship is just going to be like that. And gradually, you must admit in your own heart, you begin to sense that your relationship is going to sink to a superficial level. Because bit by bit, you're going to feel in your heart, it doesn't matter how often I forgive these people, any minute they could burst out against me again. And whatever you say, Deep down in your heart, even though you want to forgive them, and you do forgive them, deep down in your heart there's a growing uneasiness. There's a feeling inside you that this relationship is not very intimate, it's not very trustworthy, and it's not very dependable. And surely, bit by bit, you begin to question what you mean by forgiveness. And you begin to say, now is this forgiveness? Or if I do keep on 
forgiving them. Is it not just indulgence of sin that I'm involved in? Is it not just encouraging them to think that it doesn't matter how often you burst out in temper, it doesn't matter how ever you, they lose patience with their friend, that's the way life should be? And is it not true that most of us would start examining whether forgiveness is possible where there's no change in the other person's attitude to you that is permanent. Loved ones, do you not think that's what runs right through our legal system? Do you not think that's why we're all concerned about it? We all rise to the idea of forgiveness, but we feel that there's something wrong with that concept of forgiveness that we just outlined, because it looks to us very like indulgence. It looks very like carelessness about morality. Eventually, do you not think if you carried on that way, if, for instance, you substituted criticism of you or stealing your money for bad temper, do you not think you're beginning to indulge in the same amorality as the person who has sinned against you? In other words, does there not come a time when you've forgiven so often that actually you're just teaching people to ignore standards. Certainly, you must admit, if you were doing it with a child, I know it as a school teacher or an ex-school teacher, if you were doing that with a child, there's no doubt in your mind. You know you'd be teaching them to be amoral. You'd be teaching them, ah, son, it doesn't matter how often you lose your temper. It doesn't matter how often you criticize. It doesn't matter how often you steal. I'll still forgive you. You're okay. And I know from my experience that the dear kid takes full advantage of that. And he just keeps going one way. And probably we've all seen homes that have ended up in a mess because of that. In other words, surely you can only talk about forgiveness in righteousness. <coughs> Is that not true? Surely you can only talk about forgiveness, which is really the restoration of a relationship. You can only talk about the restoration of a relationship in righteousness. If the other person, sooner or later, after however many forgivenesses, eventually comes to the point where they no longer lose their temper with you, where they no longer criticize you, where you begin to have a relationship of love. And loved ones, that's really what forgiveness is, even in the Old Testament. You don't need to look up this verse, but I'll just read it to you. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And that's as far as we in our generation read. The everlasting love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. In other words, our dear God does not indulge us in amorality the way we tend to think he does and the way we have presented him to each other as doing. Our dear God planted in us the same common sense that is part of his own nature. Forgiveness only makes sense if eventually the husband or the wife or the son or the daughter or the roommate begins to change in their own hearts and lives and begins to continue a relationship of love with you. So in a sense... The problem has never been God's forgiveness. God has always been willing to forgive us. The problem is that it becomes to us just indulgence of our wrongs and our sins unless we can change ourselves. And loved ones, that's what communion is about. You're right. 
Forgiveness is preached in Jesus' name. But it's preached in Jesus' name because Jesus is the one who enables us to change so that forgiveness can be real. And it's in Jesus that all of us were changed. That's why communion is precious. If you've had things in your life that you know are wrong, and you've continued to ask God to forgive you them, and he has continued graciously to forgive you them, even though his voice has become quieter and quieter, and you're having more and more trouble listening to it. Yet he still has graciously forgiven you. If you're in that situation, and you know his voice is becoming quieter and more distant because you're continuing to do the things that you asked him to forgive you for, and therefore you're getting yourself into the same position as we described between the two friends. If you're in that spot, loved ones, God changed you in Jesus. That's what communion is about. God changed you in Jesus. He foresaw the kind of life you would live. Could I just tell you a little thing that should make that much easier for you to believe, that God foresaw the kind of life you would live. The little IBM computer, the personal computer, would take 153 days to solve a certain mathematical problem. Cray has invented one of his massive Cray computers that solves that problem in three seconds. If we can do that with our computers, is our mighty God not well able to foresee the kind of life that you would live and to provide a remedy for it? Of course he is. God has an infinite mind. And even though he doesn't make us do what we've done in our lives, he foresaw that we would do it. And he put you into his son Jesus and he destroyed you there, and he made you new and clean and whole. And if you believe that, you can be changed this morning. That's what communion is. Communion isn't just about God being willing to forgive us. Communion is about God changing you and me in Jesus so that we can continue our real restored relationship with him forever. Just one last thing. You may say, you mean through the influence of his spirit and through my coming to church and through my reading the Bible and praying and trying to obey him, I can be changed. No. No. I mean, you have been changed. That's what this dear book says. It says, Christ died for all of us, therefore all of us died in eternity above time and space. And if anyone is in Christ, and all of us are in Christ because Christ died for all and all died, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has already come. You can be that now, because God has made you it in Jesus. And through your faith in that, the Holy Spirit can bring that into your life. That's true. You can believe into that this moment. That's it. That's it. Let us pray.